Uh, we have a couple of other topics we wanted to cover. Uh, I wanted to introduce Mark Rowe from Crowded.com, who's going to head this up. Uh, and of course, uh, to our investor panelists, feel free to chime in uh, if you have anything to, to add. David, of course, you too. Uh, so Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Crowded.com and kick it off. We'll try to do this at Roundtable, so everyone else yeah. too. So before we kick off the Roundtable, I just want to spend two minutes mm -hmm. telling you a little bit more about Crowded. Well, basically, we're the place where independent workers come to find on-demand gigs. So how we do that is we, ag we aggregate the gigs and tasks from all these platforms that we're discussing here. So by way of example, you know, physical gigs and services like TaskRabbit, Thumbtack, Lux, uh, Dog Vacay, Swifto, um, shopping and market research related like GigWalk, like Field Agent, Easy Shift, uh, delivery, of course, Postmates, Insta, you know, Instacart, uh, Swill, and the Thursday to the delivery ones. Of course, ride sharing. So, and many others. I mean, there, there's no end to the list. And you know, I, as Harris said, I've been, you know, kind of the lead researcher on, you know, finding uh, all these platforms, and it's it, it's it's probably three or four hundred, and and I'm you know, it's, I'm slowing down because <laughs> because of the sheer you know mass of it. It's unbelievable. So. Um, so what we found is, from, from our research, is that one of the big problems from the worker perspective, because we're all about the worker, we're focused on helping the independent worker, and their biggest issue is they don't find enough work necessarily one, with one or two apps. And most of the workers, they only have one or two apps. They're, they're not, they're, yeah, there's power users out there that, that have a whole phone full, but that's not the majority, right? So. The problem is they'll, they'll log on, they'll see in my local area, oh, there's only like three things for me to do, they're not that interesting. Maybe they'll close that app and they'll never go back or delete, delete the app. I've actually heard that from some of the larger platforms that we've been talking to, that that is a problem, that they are, uh, they're actually hearing that from some of their workers. So by coming to Crowded instead, where now they're gonna open up their app and uh, you know, in a, on the map interface, they'll see you know a whole bunch of pins in their neighborhood and they can now um, you know, find enough opportunities to make this a more meaningful you know, um, adventure for them and, and to get out there and start really getting engaged with these platforms. So we're helping the platforms by sending them new workers because worker recruitment is always going to be an issue. And we're helping them by better engaging their existing workforce so that they don't close their app and never come back. Now they're in a you know they're in a system that has much more activity in it, and it's much more robust. And therefore, they're going to be coming back to each platform more. So we're trying to help everybody together. Um, that's that's basically what it is. Um, just to wrap up, we're we're in pre-launch right now and working on our dev uh, for both uh, mobile app and and web, and we expect to launch in um, early fall. So we'll keep you posted till then. You can go on our. You know, which is just a placeholder page right now, and you could opt in and get updates from us. Um, so that's that's crowded. So for the roundtable, like like how we said, we're going. We want input from from everybody. Um, so if you feel that you have something to add, then then you know, raise your hand or chime in. Instead of starting with the one that I was going to start with, I would like to pick up you two guys because I thought that was very interesting. Are we really arguing about 1099 versus W2? Does that even matter, or is it? Well, how do you treat your workers? And is it, it like you said? Is the vetting process is not dependent on on you know the tax status? So I can, I can argue why you should have people be W two, but I'm just curious what your answer was. Yeah. Um, so going back to the first presentation that um, that you gave over there, the number one thing that keeps the dog walkers is how much money they make. Okay, so dog walkers that you know that they say, oh, okay, I just want to uh, uh, do a walk here and there. What ends up happening is that they, they go they go they get a full time job and then they leave. Okay, so the more the more uh, work the dog walkers do, the longer they last by us. And then the more work they do, the more the more reliable they are because if this is the, their main source of income, they're not going to screw up a client, right? So the more so that's why our focus is just to give them more and more work and work with less less people rather than having thousands of dog workers which we had at first and none of them were reliable. But, but could you put someone on a W-2 and then a, 
for example, hire them for 20 hours a week, which would feel more like part-time work? Well, we hire, we, we still pay them uh, by the walk, which is ultimately it goes by the hour. So essentially, there isn't such a big difference between them being a 1099 versus a W-2, except that we have to make sure that they're not working over 30 hours a week, because then we have to start thinking about uh, health insurance. That's one issue. And the second issue is that um, we have to we have to pay another comes up to be less than ten percent for all the employer fees. So, uh, so that's but but they do but they like. What, they, what, what would stop you from giving them enough work as ten ninety nine employees? If they if they do a great job for the first three jobs you give them, whether or not their tax status, why wouldn't you just keep giving them more jobs? Um, and and, and, and sorry, quick add on. It sounds like you're almost incentivized to give them more work if they're ten ninety nine employee because then. Um, you wouldn't have the implications of a W-2 employee with 30 plus hours of work plus overtime pay and all the other things and that would come with it. But but by the way, I'm like not convinced, I'm just asking. Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> does consumer preference fall into your model at all? Do you people prefer to be paid on W-2s versus 1099s? Because there are implications in that, right? Well, there's there's two points. First of all, our dog workers could get an apartment for instance, they could get a mortgage, right? Things like that, like they want, they, they so it makes them fun. easier for them to so apply to this. You can't get it. You can't get it. You're not showing no. salary, things like that. You're not going to get an employment insurance, you're not going to get disability insurance. So it's all that's pretty, I'm pretty so. well aware. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's one point. But the second point, <laughs> Um, the dog walkers, when they started, they were like, okay, you're 1099. As 1099 employees, you can't control their hours, right? They can work whenever they want. They, they, you know. So what happens was, you know, even though they want the money, they don't, people don't want to work. It's like, okay, there's a dog walk at 7 a.m. Oh, maybe I don't want to do it. But once, once they're W-2s, then you can say, okay, you're committing to work four hours a day these times, okay? Now, they're going to start having a lot of work at that time, so it's not so much going to be dependent on, on whether it's not so much their choice, and they and it's not good for them to have that choice because then they don't last long. So that's a little bit. How does the issue market you guys are solving with Crowded address this, right? Because ultimately, what you're saying is if you have multiple platforms, like I talked to an Uber driver just this week, who's on Uber, Lyft, Sidecar, right? Okay. So can he be? I guess he could be a W two employee at three places, but. Realistically, like, doesn't that create a whole bunch of friction? Right, which healthcare plan should he be on? Which you know tax status well, is going to be? On? Is he going to share those between the three employers? Right, like, oh, so ten dollars. We're also always going to be a mixture. I mean, it, whether or not um, they're going to ten dollars, there's still um, you still need new people that are interested in doing dog walking, and it's still a discovery mechanism for that. And then once once they get to you and you do your normal vetting process. Then it's between those two parties. So and so it'll be a mixture. And also it's gonna be interesting to see, and I think you know, Evan mentioned a lot of what was underreported in some of the you know Department of, of Labor statistics is you know, uh, you know who is moonlighting, right? Which is a term we don't use anymore because it's not sexy in the on-demand economy. But <laughs> the concept of like freelance and stuff isn't like a new term. Right? It's been around for a very long time. We just don't like to call it that anymore. So when you look at people who are doing you know side gigs or, or who maintain work, the other interesting thing is you can have a W two as long as. There's not a competitive reason why you know, Uber doesn't let you drive somewhere else or, or why not or separate the industries. Let's say you're, you're, you're W-2 in some shipping company, but you know, after hours or in non-high demand, so uh, where you're not having the best utilization of, of your time, you're, you're sort of the sidekick, or, you know, then you're 1099, whatever you want to call it for something else. I think there's a lot of that happening here too that isn't as reported on because I think the media, politicians, whatever, is trying to make it really black and white that you know, you're either a W-2 or 1099, but there's but different you call yourself a franchisee. Well, then you have to deal with all the you know, all, all the franchise. Yeah. Uh, all the franchise. So, so, yeah, so maybe maybe this is because I'm naive. What are the um what are the things? I know that there's a fee that you pay. It's tons it's really, of. There's a huge. Yeah. The, 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 the you have to file the documents for the disclosure obligation. It's one million like being. It's like yeah, you're basically like a like you don't like a prospectus. That's why you don't get prospectus. This is a problem. Yeah, it's it's really hard and it's expensive. Yeah, you're not you're not billing me for this, right? No, no. <laughs> okay, I'm helping to build the ecosystem yeah, is free. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what's intriguing to me is that this discussion has not centered as much on the market forces from the the provider, the business providers 
role in whether or not they want to have employees or independent contractors. And I think, and Evan, this is what we were talking about a little bit before, the market seems to be moving in a direction in which employers generally don't want to have as many employees. They don't want to have the bench. They want the flexibility of having people that, you know, they only pay for that portion that they use. So how, how is that factoring into all of this? I'm actually seeing, I saw, uh, I spoke to a guy at SHIP last week when I was shipping all my stuff uh, back, and he said he's very excited about working for SHIP. It's a terrific environment, and they're going to be switching over to W2 shortly, and he can't wait. So, do you um, understand why, though? Did you know I, what I think he makes? fully, <laughs> I'm excited, I'm a deputy, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he's, he, he's, he was very loyal to the company and just couldn't wait for them to, to switch over. Another company, I was reporting, so I forget who it was, said they're making the switch over. It was in the, the news this morning, again, switching over from 1099 to W2. So we're seeing a, a lot of people in this discussion, and not even just that, but the discussion of should there be maybe a third class yeah. of, of employee. Can I just throw out, I, I think that we're missing the main point of distinguishing W-2 from 1099. 1099 is supposed to be an independent contractor. That's an independent business person. And if they work the majority of their time for your dog walking company, and you specify what they do, when they do, and how they do it, and they wear your company shirt, sure. <laughs> they're not independent contractors. You they would be on. if they worked five hours for you, and five hours for you, and seven hours here. You know, but that's not the case right, most of your part-time employees. That's the limitations because the Uber drivers, they, they work both for Uber and for Lyft, right? So at first they were able to do, 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 to do any kind of dog walking, and we didn't want that. We wanted to say they're working for us, they're only taking out our clients. It's not black and white. There's there's people that only work for Uber, and there's people that work for Uber and Postmates. And right. I would also push back, like, uh, let's say you're doing consulting, you have a client. Like, oh, trust me, my clients thought I was like their full time employee, yep. right? And does it mean I was um, not 1099? And but if you go 40 hours a week to that client, yeah. the government is going to say you're an employee. And and there's people who are 60 hours a week for Uber. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, right, like, I'd have a private equity firm as a client, and like, if you're working 40 hours a week, they'd say, like, don't come back, right? Um, it doesn't mean that it's not my own consulting firm. It doesn't mean that I didn't 1099 them from our firm. I have a lot of headache with the government. Understanding. I must have uh, a bunch of lawyers in the room to clarify. No, there's a bunch of factors. But also, you know, one thing no one's talking about is the difference between there's a lot of laws that apply to employees that don't apply to independent contractors, such as, you know, who owns IP when you're working for a company, who's confidential information. So there's a lot of things when we're just throwing out the difference between a W-2 and a 1099 that's being and it's in this greater but conversation. You gotta flip the question the other way, and it's not about the fact that you have certain liability or obligations from healthcare because the average person who is actually walking someone else's dog might not know the full extent of the different nuances between what are essentially a very, very old way of making a distinct decision between people who work full time and basically people who are between jobs and are trying to figure out a way to make a living vis-a-vis -vis the old thing of legislation always lags where the market is. So the interesting thing I found in the service, I think you gotta think about both what makes workers engage in this economy and what makes consumers want to use one service more than the other, which seems to be the, the notion of the cheapest is always the best. Let's take the most frictionless model where it's simply on demand and any schmo who shows up to pick you up in their Uber car is fine versus a, no, it actually matters eventually that that person is happy in their job and that that person is a quality person. And that just leads you to a different kind of model of engaging the contractors, which right now we're using the reductive construct of it's a W-2 versus 1099 to talk about. It's a more it's a more nuanced distinction, but we have pretty blunt tools but to talk about right now. According to the survey, the biggest word in the word cloud there was freedom, right? I mean, that was... And you don't hear yeah, employees, you, you don't talk to employees. Talk employees. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, but also what's interesting is that you mm -hmm. see so many millennials, right? So we see so many millennials in the market and younger millennials you know, maybe under their parents' health insurance, which is interesting. And then if you go back to the other side of it, where you know the, the older segment, which was a surprise when we looked at you know some of the data that again, you know, uh, higher income levels, a little bit more mature, more work experience, you know, higher education, a lot of them are using it as side gigs too. So they actually might have or do have 
um, health insurance from their main job, quote unquote, right, dirty word, but it's a job, and then maybe they're you know supplementing their income with these side gigs, and, and it's not important. Let's get a couple people that haven't spoke. We'll go to you in the fashion. Yeah, just one question. I mean, one of the big benefits, as I understand, of a 1099 is that you can pay them by the by the service or by the event rather than kind of an hourly wage. And so, one question I have is, as a company that has W2 employees, fly cleaners, like, is there to what extent can we have like a like a restaurant s model whereby you know, the base salary is below minimum wage, but they get a certain amount of money every time they do a drop off or a pickup. And if they don't do enough, then we then we make them good to get to a minimum wage. Like, what are just knowing how many? I like, think people might need a lawyer here for this round. I think you'd be in violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act because the minimum wage is the minimum wage. Restaurants do have a minimum wage, but part of their earnings are based on tips, so they have a different structure than most employees. Really, I mean, to be blunt, where you have a lot of startup companies, people use 1099s because it's in their view cheaper, right? You know, unemployment taxes and other things. And, and, and often not in compliance with the law. I, yeah, I, but, but they're bootstrapping, they're bootstrapping <laughs> costs and they're using 1099s to manage costs and they're really employees and, yeah. you know, that's what you see a lot of and there's, you know, there's risks associated with that, as Charles said. Is, I mean, the IRS has a, I don't know, I don't remember if it's 18 points or 21 points that kind of gets you to be an independent contractor or an employee. And, and just so I'm clear, knowing there's a lot of like legal differences or opinions sometimes, is that like everyone's legal opinion, of, of, like what he said around the minimum wage there? Just want to make No two lawyers mistakes. ever agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not from the same firm, but I agree with you. So. <laughs> Thank you. you know, I think there's a whole other issue here. How many of you are employers in this room? Yeah, and, and how many of you are sick and tired of paying health insurance benefits and all the costs that go, go along to being an employer? I'm it's sorry? It's a recruiting tool. Well, it, it is. I get that. And, but it's an accident of history, right? It's an accident of post-World War II America where there were wage freezes put in place and employers, the only way they had to distinguish themselves, which you're saying is a recruiting tool, is by providing other kinds of benefits. But but I think most employers, if they had their way, would like to be out of the business of providing those extra kinds of things that really have nothing to do with fairly compensating the people who do work for them. I think it totally also depends on the industry you're talking about, right? Um, like in tech, for example, you're so desperate to hire any good engineers, I'd give them like my fucking right hand. Kind of <laughs> yeah, um, so I think it's dependent. Yeah, sure. I mean, I get it. It depends on the laws of supply and demand in the particular industry. But I think just as a general matter, I'm an employer. I, I would love to not have those responsibilities. But you'd love to have no responsibility. Well, other than providing a lot of money, yeah, wage right? for the Yeah, but that would increase service. your tax base dramatically. What's that? That would increase your tax base dramatically. Well, no, I, look, I, I understand. It's got to be paid somewhere. I, I get that. But, you know, somehow it's an accident it's, history. It's not black and white. I mean, there, there's, I think we're likely to wind up with a third category that maybe has, you know, most of the characteristics of a 1099, but maybe with workers' comp and unemployment insurance, you know, added on. Some of these, you know, what they talk about worker protection, maybe if you work 30% for Uber and 20% here and 40% there, maybe people will contribute. Or, and, and there's going to be, you know, and there's going to be a, a spectrum where, like you were saying about, it's important, you know, for you to, to work with workers that you feel are more stable and you feel that like doing that with W2s. But there's, but there's, but there's, let's just go to this gentleman first who's waiting yeah, patiently. Let me just finish. That. This other, like, let's say GigWalk, for example, which has 900,000 gig walkers out there, and they're they're not full. They'll never be full time. They're they're doing you know they're going into CBS and they're doing a six dollar task, right? And that and they might not do another one for a week, you know. So there's always going to be a spectrum, I think, of use uses for this. So yeah, I was to be a little selfish and try not really diverging, but um, I'm just curious on your thoughts on not just like employment based, but um, asset sharing as a point of the shared economy, right? So are these people employees? Are gonna are, do they have to get paid taxes on what they're earning for renting out your room in you know storage startup? But I mean, like even your tool, your, you know, your car that you're not using. What? 
happens to those people once they go out there because they're not physically working, they're just letting someone borrow what they're not using. But they're making income. Right. Yes, the rent, correct. Right. That seems to be pretty straightforward income. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Someone who lets out the extra bedroom in their house, right. you know, so that you can see the parade, mm -hmm. that's income. It's going to be taxable income to them. If I'm a hotel, like, I'm doing a job. Like, it's not like, oh, they're just using my space, you know, to take care of your business. It's the same thing. It's like a room they own, they're letting someone use. You're just quiet. <laughs> I think we all agree. <laughs> so, all right, let, let's, let's try to... Oh, <laughs> I'd like to bring up a topic that's kind of more broad and just encompasses, well, what are we here talking about is really the question. Um, so maybe nomenclature, maybe how things are moving so fast. So by way of example, when we were coming up with the name for this event, we wound up settling on using collaborative economy. And that was a, a month and a half, ago. two months ago, maybe not even, maybe six weeks ago, right? Because we were looking for something that was all encompassing because we had the collaborative, we have sharing, we have freelance, 1099, on demand, gigs, right? And there's stuff that's asset based, like you were just saying, there are things that are more labor only. Um, so, and then there's on demand economy, which fits some things, but not all of them. But that seems to be the hottest top, you know, uh, name that people want to use. So, you know, and the other part of it that if I was doing this today again to name this event, I probably wouldn't have used collaborative economy. Now I would use on demand and gig economies. And guess why I would use that? What well, happened two weeks, was well, three weeks ago, Hillary gave a speech where she referred to this whole phenomenon with those two terms. And since then, that seems to be where things are coalescing around as far as the terms. So the question is, you know, what are we calling this? And is it one thing, or are there going to be things that break apart, segments of this um, space that break apart and go in different directions? No, that's it's, there's a lot of a lot of things going on. Anybody? I can, in my opinion, and for the life of me, maybe it's naive. I think they're all quite similar, but I think there was like backlash against like Uber saying they're part of the sharing economy when they're not so much sharing the billions that they have. So I think they started <laughs> building the on-demand economy. It's kind of like a band that wants to be like cool and say, hey, we're independent. In reality, they're signing with like the largest record label that exists. To me, it's kind of like what fits the brand that brand mentality more than exactly what you want. But in reality, they're all doing. Same thing. I don't, I don't think so. I think there's a, a difference, right? Airbnb doesn't have a worker issue. It is not in the on demand economy. Nothing's on demand. There's right. no 1099 workers. That's the true collaborative consumption economy. Rent the runway, same thing. They own assets and share them amongst all their users. That is not what to do with. I would argue, though, um, the difference between rent the runway and Airbnb is that <laughs> there's many parties on one end that receive income sure. and many parties on the other that receive income. And it's not just because of a transaction of exchanging a good, it's also a service. I agree with you. My, my point of comparing them was just neither had this 1099 worker W-2 issue. No one's saying that by owning a home or renting your home out on Airbnb, you should be a, a W-2 worker, right? So I think there's different nuances with each. So when you say, what do we call this? I mean, it depends what you want to talk about, right? I mean, if you want to talk about collaborative consumption, then you, you have to include that. If you just want to talk about 1099 worker gig economy, then whatever name you call it is whatever name you call it. And some of the collaborative side of it too is true sharing where I'm in my neighborhood and we're sharing these power tools and no one there's no funds that are changing hands with we're you know where your Airbnb is transactional. So right. Right. that's so it's a sharing is a collaborative that's where the stuff I think the opposite right is this all actually started more with the collaborative consumption movement and now these oh, on demand economy companies are trying to consider themselves part of the sharing economy <laughs> and, and some fit in in some ways. I mean, really what you're sharing is the people and the talent and, and that's the asset, it's the human capital that's being right. shared here. Well, we're using a broad brush to put a lot of kind of vaguely similar from a consumer usage standpoint, businesses that are really very, very different are going to wind up being highly vertical. The difference between an Airbnb model, a 
an Uber model, and I'm the dude who's going to CVS to buy you your Werther's kind of mints or whatever, are totally different businesses with totally different economics. I think we're just trying to talk about them again in the general bucket that over time, like this would be like 1996, we talk about the internet. Now we're going to talk about the internet. We talk about retail on the internet. We talk about mobile on the internet. We talk about B2B back backend on the internet. We make a similar type of kind of siloing. There is the trust issue that. Oh, so that makes it a little bit more. On the consumer end, they're very, very, the reason we group it is because from a consumer usage, sharing, renting someone's house they don't understand, going into a strange car, or leasing my car or my bike, which is one that I find particularly funny, right? Yeah, why Those are all similar things. Why has like not, not as many things gone wrong in Airbnb as we all thought? Because of eBay. PR. You know, no, it's not just the damage control. control. Yeah. They pay millions. If something happens, they pay millions to shut the person up. Yeah. More things happen than you know about. So if you, yeah, but also part of this eBay review, eBay style reviews too, that helps at some level. But okay. yeah, there's always issues. You know, so the common thread here too is sort of the quality control question, right? And, and I think it ties right into your point about trust. Uh, you, know, you don't know whose house you're going to, and the person who's letting out their house doesn't know who's going to be there. And it, it takes a certain... Or you reach a point like an Uber, which is one of the first ones where you go, you know something, the guy's got to be good, all right? They're so big, it's just, you know, I'm not worried. And right. that takes a but Or the guy's got to be better than the crack right. it's, yeah. it's, it's not that people are more trusting, they're not. Yeah. So no, no, of course not. What they're trusting right. now is right. right. the, right. the, right. the culture has now become accustomed to exactly. ratings and reviews. That's So that's what they're trusting is the is the ratings and reviews. I think it's so also to answer Ali's question, it's the type of person, right? The type of person who's an early adopter and going to live in someone else's house or drive in, let's say, a relay, relay rides car, you know that you're part of this community. So you want to get worse? Uh, I do. As they get bigger, right? As you, yeah. then, well, as you start to I'm do sorry, Airbnb, do I think it'll get worse? So as, as you start viewing Airbnb not so much as um, renting an apartment from a man, yeah. this individual whose picture I see, and I think that I'm really renting it from the next stage Marriott or a property manager that has 50 units, you probably don't treat it the same way. Well, that's one of the reasons why I think people are, more people are more willing to rent on Airbnb, right? Because when I didn't know about Airbnb, and you're like, hey, I'm, you know, you can rent my apartment in Brooklyn, I'd say, mm, maybe not, right? <laughs> but now, because you have guarantees, right? Uber's big enough, Airbnb's big enough, whereas a normal consumer, as my mother, I'd say, okay, well, there's some level of brand recognition, there's some level of guarantee from the actual corporate entity that's running the marketplace, right? Where I feel some level of protection when I'm a first time user of the service. Do you think any of that fact that it's been out more like public has changed the mindset of people? Like, I'm sure it has had an impact. Like people are more That's accepting of mainstream. Things. Yeah, yeah. That, well, my, my, my mom three years ago would have never used Uber. Now she would. Yeah. Think about the mass though. I and mean, like you hear about the the rave stories I and mean, all the other horrible stuff that happens in Uber every now and then. But think about all the millions of rides every day where you get in the car, you get to where you're going on time quickly, easily, sure. and you turn the app off. You didn't touch your credit cards. You didn't do anything that wasn't just super smooth and easy. Nobody's talking about the fact that the, the incidence of problems is so small is small. in those places. And right? there's issues with yellow cabs too. It's not like one has issues and the other doesn't. Part of it though is that the yellow cabs are the analysis system so broken. Like it's kind of it's a fairly loaded. It's a fairly low bar. I think you want to try to come here. It's like somebody competing with like the MTA for customer service. <laughs> 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 it's it's a bad, right? I, I, I like to. That's, to, to that's actually a really important point when you think about the pain points of the alternatives. Yeah. So particularly for multi cultural hair care, the salon experience is horrendous. So you're literally, you can be in a hair salon for hours on end. And so any other opportunity, any other option that can give you your time back, I mean, we've had customers book appointments sight unseen. We have, we're still working on our customer reviews. We haven't got them up yet. Um, you know, we're still basically doing a lot of this through word of mouth, and they will still pay hundreds of dollars to get someone to come to their house to get their hair done because they're just that disgusted. They're that fed up with the with that ex other alternative experience. So I definitely think that makes a really big difference. And then also in terms of trust, um, you know, making sure that we're providing a really, really credible experienced stylist 
is definitely key. You know, it can't just be some random Joe Schmo who's driving a, a Camry, you know, to, to come pick you up or to, to come into your house and do your hair. And creating that, that culture, that, that, you know, that company culture is extremely important. I don't care if you're a W-2, a 1099, whatever that is, you know, we make sure, and it was even in the survey, that the independent contractors want education. They want development. They want opportunities outside of just money. And so if you're making that, that culture and you're creating that, those types of opportunities, you're going to get that person that's going to give you five-star VIP service every single time. And that's what's going to keep the customers coming back and really happy. So. Uh, actually, wait, uh, the chairman did not have any questions, so I want to get them. By the way, uh, we've eliminated the whole hand raising. Let <laughs> so me just speak up and call it out. Uh, I think the trust issue is, is can be pertinent to certain industries. I'm also in the pet care space, which is seems to be popular. You should have said over here, sir. I'm sorry. It seems to be a popular uh, 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 uh We um we did a research before I started. What's the name of the company? Doggy baby. Um, and it's it's it, it's nuanced. It's like Airbnb. It's, it's similar, but it's through your social network of people you know. And um, we did a lot of research before we started to, to, to fly with the idea. And what we came out with uh, was that ninety percent of pet owners only turn or turn, naturally turn to people they know, friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, someone that they are already <coughs> comfortable with, and then. When they can't get help from someone they know, they end up turning to services on the side to help them provide them. And um, you know, we continue to like as we build our product, continue to ask people their comfort level, what they were looking for, and ratings became, yeah, they found ratings to be somewhat helpful, but they always found that uh, someone that they know telling them that they they used that person before was much more like safe. It's all the, the equivalent of like you're sitting on a park and you want to go to the Hamptons for a weekend, you have your baby with you, your friend's like, let's go, or you're gonna hand your kid off to this guy next door, next to you, uh, and he's got five stars. Um, <laughs> um, and for us, within the pet care space, I think there are a lot of like issues with trust, and trust is like the keys into your house, the key with your dog, and all those kind of things, and I think that there are issues that we face with, with Doggy being being layered. We're, we're serving as a layered network, kind of like LinkedIn, where the only people you ever see are based on your first collection, second level connections, you can ask those people if those people are safe and borrow them for your network. And trust for us is like essential for how, the way we find our dog owners being able and feeling comfortable getting the way that they get service. It's the, it's, they don't even care about money. They'll throw out a job for $100 versus $20, but they only care that they're like, in our, it's the ones we work with, that they know that like their friends used it or they, they've done it themselves before. Yeah, our, our platform is built off of a very similar concept in that, like, we were talking about Uberification earlier. I think it was Satine that said, um, like, you, know, you can't really Uberify every single space in vertical. And then childcare and, and pet care, I think, are two great examples. I, I don't really care how many stars somebody has. Like, my son getting picked up from school is, needs to be somebody that I know, my neighbor, or me. But that's not going to be something that I'm requesting an Uber for. So, I mean, on our platform, you have kind of friends the same way you do on any social network, and then you have uh, an, an aspect of your pack, which is like your most trusted network of people. And when you request a walk, it only goes to your best friend, your neighbor, and the dog service that you trust and always use. It doesn't go to, to anybody on the street that wants to walk dogs, W2 or and like you said, it doesn't matter. You know, it has to be somebody within that central, central piece. I'd like to switch gears for a second and um, bring up a topic I really want to hear from the, the co-founders you know more so on this one which is basically about customer and worker acquisition you know uh, what's what strategies uh, are you finding effective um, maybe talk a little bit about you know are you having trouble more on one end and on, then on the other and the whole chicken and egg you know as you're starting how you dealing with that uh, I can do some commentary on what I've done so far. I find that the supply side, at least from an asset lending platform, it's much more easy to validate. You can go to someone and say, like, hey, you have extra space, you have this tool that you're not using, you want to make money on it, it seems very appealing to them because it's no cost to them. They just have to maybe be inconvenienced a little bit by getting the person inside or just getting that asset to the person. Uh, what I've been struggling with is just, you know, from a demand perspective, 
uh, having them fit the mold of what we're trying to provide them. So maybe the platform's slightly different than what they're expecting. Um, so how do you go about, aside from asking everyone in, that you come across, like, would you use this? Do you use something like this now, uh, or like an alternative to what you're trying to launch? And then say, how about you try out my product? So you, you're finding it easier to go to the supply side yeah. first. Yeah, and I think that's uh, actually a little comforting that the whole liquidity aspect has been a major issue with some companies, right? You need to have this uh, mass supply to service your, the, the demand side. And if you don't have that, then your customers are just going to be unhappy and not use your platform. So I find it depends, I guess, if you need workers or if you're just lending on an asset. But at least from the asset lending side, it's been a little okay. less successful. Um, for me, for us, I found that it's not such a, a hard problem of like getting the supply and the mat. Uh, especially when we started, it, everybody was out of job, so it's not so hard to get that one. <laughs> Well, it's so hard to get that off of Everybody's looking to earn money, um, and you don't need that many doll walkers in order to make it work. So it's not so, it's not so much of a problem. Like I know, like let's say Facebook, you have to have all your friends there for it to work. Or maybe it's like it's not so much of a problem to, to balance it out. Right. So same thing. The supply side is easier. Well, both sides are quite easy, but I'm saying that you don't need tons of supply in order for it to work. Yeah. Right. Because with your model specifically, you're trying to get more whether they're part-time or you know, full-time, whatever, but you know, more of a concept of more concentrated work. So you need less workers to accomplish this. You need less walkers to accomplish the same goal. If you had people doing one or two walks here, you need an order of magnitude. Right, so actually walkers. when we started, we started in a very small area. We said we're only servicing this set little section of Manhattan. We're only servicing you know, these and these times. So we don't need that many. And then we said, okay, now we're serving also this part of Manhattan. So now we're gonna add a little more. Now we're gonna serve Brooklyn as well. So that's how, and also like, you know, more, more flexible in the hours so that we, we gradually added what we offer. And it's not so hard, it's not such a hard problem. So this is also the nuance between if you're a true on-demand company or not. I don't know if your dog walking is really on-demand or if it's more scheduled. Mm -hmm. So if you're on-demand, even if you have one single user, you need to have enough liquidity to have coverage in terms of geography and time. So you, by definition, have to have oversupply. If you're more a marketplace, and so we're in a company called Stylist, where you can book out days in advance, you can match your supply and demand and keep growing one with the other because you don't have that liquidity option. So, so that's where that slight change in business model can really change how you have to stop your supply side. And the onboarding process, so the time it takes to onboard a specialized person. Again, I'm not as familiar with how specialized or the quality of dog walkers and how much training you need. But for, um, for workers that, are, that you need training around, like a stylist needs to have several years of experience. They need to have a cosmetology license. And then even on top of that, onboarding them into how you want the, how your company wants that experience to be, there's going to be some time. There's definitely a time lag. So I definitely think you have to have the supply from for our business. You have to have the supply ready because once the customers do start to come, who are already experiencing some problems, where you know we're getting phone calls where we can't service that particular area, and we thought we could, and you know we thought we had the stylus that we wanted, and in fact we don't. So you know it's one of those things where it's a constant very, very rigorous um, review of how the supply is managed and how you're deploying it to um, to various customers. The, the difference there, too, is the capital intensity of, of those different types of business dramatically different. Absolutely. Well, it's specialized versus unspecialized. Right. You know, if it's gigwalk, as Mark mentioned, then it's you know, field agent or any of those companies, and if it's a $6 task, you have a smartphone, I'm not vetting someone versus if you know they're they're Uber, they did a background check, or if they're task rapid, they did an in-person interview. With with your business, it's even specific because they need even a, a, a certification or a license, which is even even you know, more specialized. So I think that's a great point too. Is there's different levels of you know uh, unspecialized versus specialized. Anything else on that as far as maybe user acquisition uh, methods or that that are working or not working? Worker, worker acquisition, or do we want the next one? Yeah, so, I mean, we have a tremendous friction in our user acquisition process. Uh, I wish it was easier. <laughs> um, 
you know, we block people from being able to actually send out jobs and get jobs unless they participate in building the community around them. Everything based on who you know creates an additional layer of friction for us in order for our whole, to self-police our own environment and our network. And I would, you know, a user's journey where we would rather be somewhere between like zero to 15 days before their network around them populates is taking sometimes between like 15 days to three months. Um, and that for us is a pain point, uh, a dramatic pain point for one in which we're willing to work with over the long term because we think sustainability and being able to like feel comfortable with who's around you as a pal that poses just anybody is going to sort of be something that we can stand with long term. Can I say something about um, pain points and limiting factors? What I'm hearing is I listen to this, this is really focused on the consumer economy. But there's other elements of the sharing of collaborative economy. For example, knowledge and information sharing. And so what occurs to me is that you folks who have a, a consumer focus, you're doing a push. You have a service, you have something to provide, you, you establish that you can provide it, and you want to get the users for it. Other parts of the collaborative economy are pulled because I have a need and that I, I seek to get that served. So, push and pull it. You know, mm -hmm. So it's a question of if you're providing a new service that didn't exist before, or if, you, if you're taking, if you're basically replacing an existing industry and doing it better. So that's well, the service is, is a push in my mind, but a need is a pull. Actually, I, I agree with you. Like, I think what, I, what I'm trying to do is um, to take the self storage industry. People, everyone puts the garage. They, uh, you see ads everywhere like, I'll give you three months free and a locker for you to do something. Like, I don't think people focus enough on the needs of the person looking for storage, right? So I wanted to try to approach it from that way say, like, here's the stuff that. Maybe you've got something to offer. Yeah, and then the people who have the room of capabilities of delivering that come to we probably have room for, for one more topic, which this may be more slanted back towards the investors, but um, as far as regional plays, I mean, there's a lot of fragmentation, and where is this headed as far as consolidation? You now, we were talking earlier today about the amount of money being raised by some of these companies, and like, well, you know, for example, uh, Lux uh, Valet Parking. You know, they raised over thirty million dollars. So what are they going to do with that money? You know, <laughs> so well, my answer to that was that they, like everybody else in this space, maybe they're regional now, but they have national ambitions, so they could certainly spend the money that way. But and they all have national ambitions, but most of them are not going to get there. So, what's that going to look like? You know, over time as it starts to roll up. Well, I don't think anybody invests to have a regional play, right? I mean, but it's just. I don't know, just the model doesn't seem to be big enough from my perspective, so. Right. I, I think there will be consolidation, there inevitably will be, right? Especially as you move up the food chain and you favor, you, you get to write bigger checks and you get to find companies that you can buy, and so maybe you put two or three together. Yeah. Um, just as, you know, as the, uh, as the amount of money and capital that's out there to be to invest it has ballooned. Um, you know, people got to put, put money to work, and so we will see consolidation in that way because that's that's how you can get bigger companies. Don't you enjoy economies of scale, even if it's different verticals? When when you put the company together and, and utilize the systems that you have in place that can accommodate a much larger market. And I, uh, just from something I heard from a. CEO from a ride sharing company in Europe, right? He said that he had difficulties going to other countries because of cultural reasons, right? You have one model that may work well in a particular country. You go from London to India, it's not the same type of people you're dealing with. So you have to make sure you take those cultural factors into account, like that much more so, because it's like a peer-to-peer -peer sort of relationship. That's a thing much more of a factor. I would actually argue that the economies of scale are not as great because the back ends are not as heavy on, on demand where ultimately you're just buying users and you're really just driving up the user acquisition costs. And I think ultimately that still is the big tipping point that hasn't happened in this whole world. Again, getting back to that same slide that showed only 10% of the new 
where to go. And I wonder, I've been wondering this for years now, is this economy bigger? Is it really smaller than we're actually making it to be? I don't know the answer. Hmm. It's pretty hmm. So I, we're, we're about at the end. So before we do that, is there anybody that has uh, some burning question or a topic that they really want to hear about? Let's see what that's about. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, pose a question for the investors. Uh, you know, I'm sure you guys see a ton of pitch presentations or, or what have you every day on, on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of presentations, I think, or from, from what I see from, from other entrepreneurs, focus on growth, right? User acquisition and growth trends. How much do you guys look at retention, right? If, if you know, company X has a 10% growth rate, but they're not retaining customers, and, and another company has a much slower growth rate, but you know, 95% of their customers have stayed on the platform. You know, anybody in mobile knows that you know, 70 to 80% of apps get downloaded once and never used again. So how much do you weigh in on retention versus growth rates? Okay. I, mean, I think it's all of us, right? Investors that would look at uh, how many times the like, user comes back to, to the site and they're purchasing, what's their total purchasing patterns, you know, uh, can you upsell them? I mean, I think that's it's almost always done. I mean, don't ever lose sight of uh, I mean, a lot of people that have some of these huge apps that came into the marketplace. That was their strategy, just to take it over. And that's, if that's what it is, just be very clear with your investors up front. Because that's a different strategy, so don't mix them up. Uh, yeah, but, and please. Yeah, I mean, especially at the early stages, so you need to demonstrate top line growth. Saying like, I have a hundred users who come back every single day, every single day of a year. It's like cool, maybe, but that doesn't make a big business, right? It's not a venture fundable business, and that's something you should think about as well, right? Think about, thinking about targeting investors, like what are the different profiles of returns that investors, of the investors that you're you're speaking to, right? There's there are venture funded businesses and there's what we broadly bucket lifestyle businesses and that's those aren't bad businesses or bad businesses and great businesses to run as you know an uh, an entrepreneur but they may not have the great trajectory and sort of the outcome potential of something that a venture investor will get. No, we we've been pitched uh, at our fund where uh, a company would come in and say, "Yeah, we got ten thousand new users this month," and it sounds like, "Wow, that's terrific!" And it's like, "Well, we did a huge ad campaign, and mm-hmm. they downloaded it, and they Just never really used it, and they yeah. got they got the free whatever, and they never yeah. opened it again." So it's not as attractive as you know something else. Like Good time. Maybe the yeah. way to look at it is what when you say you're watching growth. Well, how do you define growth? And maybe it's monthly active users. When that number is growing. Well, I, I think you're probably talking more about like just top line revenue growth, right. right? And I think the reason that that is a metric that's used across to look at is because that bakes in your new users, right? Which accelerates that growth. It bakes in your retention rate, right? So the way that you get that accelerated growth is you have your old users who rebook, and then you have your new users who book, and it also bakes in your user acquisition cost because if it's low, you can take those profits, reinvest, and it's all about new users. So it's not just about, and this is the home joy that everybody's reading about, and their growth, if you dig in, may not have been for all the right reasons. I think there's a difference there, but there's a reason it's not. They look at growth, but but they look at the drivers of that growth. So eventually, the kind folks who cover in English are going to want to get us out of here. So I think that is my cue to thank everyone uh, for coming tonight. Uh, again, uh, I want to make sure that we're going to be sending that survey out to everybody. I wanted to thank our sponsors at Crowded.com. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, David Soren, and David, your entire staff here have been very helpful. And uh, Yukara, thank you guys so much for hosting us. Uh, and of course, our panels and, uh, and everyone else. We hope to see you again at, uh, at an event soon. So thank you all very much. Thank you.